Well, it's great to be here again. Thank you for all coming to part two of our marriage workshop. Because that's what it is. This isn't a presentation or a sermon. This is actually just a workshop. And if you missed our last session, or the first one, I guess you might say, is that this was the time we gave our, our testimony of what our life and marriage was like. Uh, we told you very transparently what had happened. And we, as you know, we started out with it all hearts and flowers and absolutely thrilled with each other and couldn't wait to be together. And as time went on, within 30 years, we ended up basically almost hating each other and actually talking about getting a divorce. So that was the true story here. And, uh, and I, we wanted to be transparent with you because I, I wanted you to know that we weren't Mr. and Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes, where we had this perfect life together, uh, we had all the information we needed about marriage, so we had this perfect marriage together and our life was just wonderful. Because it wasn't that way at all. Uh, we, my wife and I, have been through hell and back. Uh, because of ignorance. We had no training, no instruction. Nobody told us what to expect or how to live our life. They best basically just sent us off and said, here, go make a life of yourselves together. And it didn't work, just like it doesn't work for millions of other couples. Because ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance causes pain. It's hurtful, and it causes utter destruction in families. You know, this last uh, week, my wife and I were talking over what we had, uh, were going to discuss and what we had learned over the years. And, and actually, it brought a lot of sadness. Because we kept asking God, why did it take 30 years to teach us what we know. Why did we have to spend 30 years living a life in such pain? And so we had to remind ourselves, you know, God had to have us learn what doesn't work in a marriage before he could have us teach what works in a marriage. And so when we thought about that, you know, it became all worth it because we're gonna share some things with you in the coming sessions that are absolutely incredible. It has totally repaired our marriage, repaired our life together. And we wanna share that with you because it's so important, because it's just not taught anywhere. The churches have tried to teach us about marriage to some degree, but unfortunately some of the things that they even tried to teach were wrong and they caused more harm than good. So we're gonna share some things with you that I know are God-ordained. Not because we read it in a book, but because we lived it. Well, today we're gonna to begin building a marriage structure. Because unless there is a solid foundation to a structure, it will not stand. It just won't. And the Bible talks about a person who tries to build a house on sand. Well, that's what we tried to do. We tried to build a marriage on sand. And when the wind blew and the rains came, our house came down and great was the fall. So God says when you're gonna build a house, it has to be on a solid foundation. It has to be rock solid. So today we're gonna to start giving you that foundation and show you what the foundation is and where it begins. Because if you don't have this foundation, your marriage will never succeed the way God wants it to succeed. So let's turn over to Ephesians 5, verse 25. And we're gonna begin talking about what that foundation is. If you have a Bible there, I don't know where mine went. Oh, here okay. it is. 
Well, I know the scripture. I don't even need to look at it. Ephesians 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, before we can really understand what, thorough, what this is, I'm getting a little feedback here. Is, um, before we can go on, we need to understand what Christ died for. It says Christ died for the church. He gave himself up for her. Well, the church isn't this building. The church isn't the corporation. It's not the organizations that you see in the world that call themselves churches. What Christ died for was the ecclesia. The ecclesia is those who are in, in congregation together. And if you study even deeper than that, you find that the ecclesia, he was actually saying he was the bride. He, was, he died for the bride. Hmm? Oh, thanks for taking that out. I forgot to put my timer on. <laughs> we might be here for two hours if I don't put this on. Are we working? Okay, good. I was going to ask you where that was. Yeah, I just put it there. <laughs> so, the scripture says that Christ gave himself up for his church. And as I just described, it wasn't the building, it wasn't the organization, it wasn't the corporation, it was the ecclesia is what he gave his life for. And if you study into it, you find that the ecclesia was actually what he called the bride. We are the bride of Christ. And Christ put himself to death for us, his bride. And so in, in Ephesians 5, verse 25, God is instructing the husbands. He says, love your wife as Christ loved his bride and gave himself up for it. So that's, the, that's our, a very found, our, our, the, the very pinnacle of the foundation, is that if we don't get that, husbands, if we don't get and understand that to the depth and the magnitude of what God is trying to express here, that we are to give our life up for our wife. We'll never, no matter what we try to explain to you from here on, we'll stand. Because you won't get it. It won't make any sense. The very foundation is the husband has to be willing to give up his life for his wife. So that's the instruction. Well, when I first was married, I thought, well, I love my wife. I'd sacrifice for her. You know, I'd take a bullet for her if I had to. You know, if something happened, I'd willingly come in and, and, and take the bullet. But that's not what this scripture is talking about. It's not about, it's not about being a hero one time for your wife. It's what it's talking about is that you're to sacrifice yourself every day. Sometimes moment to moment. Because if you don't love her that way, the whole system, the whole marriage doesn't work. Well, if you look into the subject of what love is, because I didn't know what that Ephesians 5 meant at all. I thought, well, I love my wife. But if you look into the scriptures, you will find that the Bible talks about two kinds of love. There's two kinds. There's one that's called filial love, which is what human love is. This is what we all can relate to, human love. Human love is all about feelings. When my wife kissed me the first time when I was at my 20th birthday, I mean, it was like a bolt of lightning went through me. I was so struck with her that our whole life together after that, the beginning of it, was I was so mesmerized and excited with her that I couldn't stand not being with her because of how it made me feel. And so I continued to seek her out because of the feeling that she gave me. But nobody told me as a young husband that human love is not what Ephesians 5 is talking about. 
Ephesians 5 is a whole different kind of love. I was trying to love my wife with human love. And being human love is based on feelings. My feelings can change in a heartbeat. Because if she said something to me that was embarrassing me, or that angered me, or that irritated me, all the warm fuzzies were gone, like that. And because my love for her was based on feelings, I would react out of my feelings, which were very negative at the time, and I would say something to her, kind of mean. Well, of course, then she would react out of her feelings and say things back to us, back to me. And so here we were fighting back and forth, back and forth over feelings and hurt feelings because we were trying to express human love to one another. And it fell short. Filial love is recognized by how it feels. And also, human love is conditional. See, I, I'd love my wife as long as she did what I told her to do. We were cool. <laughs> yep, that was true. <laughs> Whenever my wife, if my wife would just submit to me, I would love her. But the first time she didn't submit to me, the, the feelings would come back. And so I'd react out of those feelings. So human love is conditional. I will love you if. I will love you if you make me feel good. I'll love you if you pamper me. I'll love you if you fill in the dots. So it's conditional. And if you don't meet the conditions, which he didn't many times, our emotions took over, our feelings took over, and, and off we were on another fight or an argument. All because of feelings. But like I said, nobody ever taught us that human love will not get you through Human love is good. I mean, we have to have it. That's the way God designed us. But human love has no legs. You know, really, human love is only just a chemical reaction in your body. When you have a good feeling, if somebody makes you feel good, it's like your body injects some kind of a chemical into your body that makes you feel good, almost like a high. And so we get stuck on the high. We think we've got to have the high here. We gotta, she has to do these things so I'll feel good about myself or feel good inside. And when she doesn't, she doesn't do things that make me feel good and make me angry or embarrassed or whatever. Then my love is off. My human love is cut. So I wish somebody would have taught me when I, was, when I was newly married, that, hey, lo human love is good. I'm glad you guys are really excited about each other, and you're just Twitter-pated, and you think your life is going to be wonderful and joyous, but that's only good on good days in your marriage. <laughs> and as we all know, not every day is a good day. <laughs> and so as soon as something shows up, and, you know, some type of a, of a problem, is created in your life, that human love is gone. It's out the door. So what kind of love is God talking about here in Ephesians 5? Well, if you look at it, this is a word that's, that in Greek is called agape. It's agape love. That's the way God loves. God is telling us in Ephesians 5 to love our, our wives the way God loves us. It's a sacrificial love. It has nothing to do with feelings. It's a sacrificial love. And if you you kind of want to write this down, here's the definition of agape love. It's a conscious decision of the mind to sacrifice one's own will for the benefit of another. Let me read that again. A conscious, God's love is a conscious decision of the mind to sacrifice one's own will for the benefit of another. It's totally sacrificial. It has nothing to do with feelings. 
For a man to put his flesh to death is a total sacrifice. It's a sacrifice because we don't want to put our flesh to death. We like our flesh. We, and our flesh is just basically our will, what we want to do. And also, agape love is unconditional. It's unconditional. It's not, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Christ didn't go to the cross by saying, uh, you know, if you just guys would just pay me a little more attention, I'll go to the cross for you. No, he went to the cross when we were yet sinners. We were not perfect. We were not trying to serve him. It had nothing to do with conditions. It was totally unconditional. You know, John 3, verse 16, we, you know, it's a very popular scripture. You read that at every football game. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we would not perish. That's sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. God showed us that he was willing to sacrifice his own son. Not because of a feeling, not because of a warm fuzzy for us. He did it out of a moral responsibility. Because God created everything, and because he created everything, he was responsible for everything that took place. And so he had to fix the problem when man fell. He had to figure a way that he could redeem these people. So he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, allowing his son to be crucified and given up. And Christ himself, he had to give up himself totally as well. When he was praying in the garden the night before he was crucified, he prayed to God, please take this cup from me. Please take this cup from me. Because he knew what crucifixion was going to be like. He'd seen it happen. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Christ even had to give up his will. And so this is what men are supposed to do. And we have to do it. That's the, way, that's the only way marriage will work. God told the husband, love your wife as Christ loved his bride and gave himself up for it. That's the way the machine works. And that, it has to be in that order. The man, the husband, has to be willing to sacrifice his will so that his wife can do what she was created to do. And unfortunately, in the churches, we've done so much damage to our wives by pulling a scripture out of context and beating them up with it. Husband, or wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit and make sure that you obey him. You know, these scriptures in, in, in the Bible about marriage were only snapshots, only snapshots of what a marriage will look like if it's running the way God designed it. The problem is we've been pulling things out of context and demanding that our wife do what, you know, what she's supposedly commanded to do. It was like, it's like an engine. Let me, you know, you guys are real mechanical, so let me, let me give it to you in a, in a sense of a motor. Let's say my, your wife is like the spark plugs. She's supposed to submit and obey, but she's like the spark plug in the motor. But the spark plugs don't work if they're not connected to the rest of the engine. I mean, if you take the spark plug out and you put it on the bench and demand that the, that the spark plug work, it's not going to work because it's designed to be connected to the rest of the motor that is functioning the way it's supposed to function. If a, if a husband is not loving his wife with sacrificial love, the wife can't respond. It, ha it has to be connected. And that's something that has never been was never explained to me when I was a young husband, 
I've never heard that. I've never heard that taught anywhere. We have pulled the scriptures out of context and demanded that our wife function disconnected from the rest of the engine, the marriage engine. Do you grasp that? The weight of that? You, a husband has to be in the proper alignment, the proper order of what God has put in place. If a husband loved his wife, totally sacrificially, like Christ gave up his life for his bride, the wife would have no problem at all submitting to her husband. She would have no problem obeying him. But because we have tried to, to make the marriage work not in the proper order, is where the marriages have come apart. And husbands, I, you know, there's probably guys out there that have been divorced once, twice, and who knows how many times. But you know what? It's, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, you know. You guys married your wives because you wanted to be with her, you wanted to love her, you wanted to care for her and take care of everything for her. You didn't marry her to be miserable or to make her miserable. You had, you had the right heart to care for your wife. It's just nobody ever taught you how to do it. And so we did damage. Not because we were bad people, just because we were ignorant. We didn't know. You know, and Satan has done such damage. He attacked her in the garden and he's still attacking her. In this world, a woman is nothing more than a possession. Instead of being the absolute blessing that God ordained for the wife to be to a husband, the husband has been taught through lies that your wife is trying to take your fun away from you. She's trying to wear the pants. If you're, if you're kind, kind to your wife and you try to please her and you try to uh, care for her every need, she's only going to take advantage of that. Don't do that. Keep your wife on a short leash. <laughs> is that not true? How many jokes have I, or how many times have I been in, among men and heard jokes talked and told about their wives? How belittling they are to their wives. Where does that come from? It comes from Satan. He's trying to destroy marriage. And, and the way he tries to destroy it is by, through ignorance, and not teaching the man how important it is that he lay his, wife, his life down for his wife every day. You know, I, I believe, well, I'll try this for a while. I'll see how it works when I found out that I, I should do that. I fully expected my wife to take advantage of that and to want to control me and to demand even more. It was amazing. That's not what happened. What happened is what God designed to happen. When I began to love her in a sacrificial way, she began to respond to me in a way that she was created to do. Was to care for me as well and pour out her heart to me. So you see, it's ignorance. It's just totally ignorance is what, is, what has happened to us. You know, I, I've thought about this. And if I had been taught in the beginning. I just wanted to add okay. in that, is that the sad part of what he's saying? Is that those jokes that he was listening to and those demeaning things were said in church. They were said in men's groups, that, you know, um, Friday lunches and uh, with elders. This is what was being said at lunch. Not that he was hanging out at the gym with worldly men and hearing this. This was in church. So that shouldn't be ever. Uh -huh. 
Well, he bought into the lie, Satan's lie. Well, I wish at the beginning of our marriage somebody would have taught me about what agape love, because I would have done it. I would have. I, I loved her so much. I wanted to please her so much. I would have. I would have climbed mountains. I would have forged streams. I would have done whatever was asked of me in the beginning if I would have only known what agape love was. If I would have known what agape was, I would have always put her needs in front of mine. Always. I would always have sought after what, was, what she was asking for, what she needed to feel. I would have put my flesh to death and I would have listened to her. Instead of blowing her off, I would have listened to what she had to say. I would have told her every day that I loved her. I wouldn't have missed a day. Because if I'd have known that I was supposed to do that, that I was supposed to make sure and, and make the sacrifice of reminding myself every day that I needed to love her and tell her how much I loved her, I would have done it. I would have told her every day how much I appreciated her and all the work that she'd done around the house. I would have sacrificed myself <laughs> and did that. I would have made sure that I made the time to tell her that. But again, I didn't know. I didn't know I should have. I didn't know that I was supposed to. I would have always listened to her concerns. I would have never blown her off like I used to do when she would try to talk to me about something that was on her heart or a fear or a concern. I'd just blow her off. Don't bother me now. I'm busy. I gotta watch this game. Not understanding that if I would have known what agape love, I would have turned the TV off. I would have turned around and faced her and said, honey, what is it? What am I doing that I can do different? How can I care for you? There's lots of things I, I would like to do over. And you know, you've got, you got some young marrieds out there. You've got plenty of time to fix it now. Don't wait for 30 years to try to clean up a mess that you don't have to make. It's ignorance that makes us make so many messes. No, I can't read my notes. Here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I would have never left her in the kitchen alone to do the dinner dishes while I went in and watched TV, which I always did. Yeah, that's a woman's job. Yeah, she cooked a nice meal for me, but you know, it's a woman's job. I'm just going to go on in, watch TV, let her in there by herself to clean the kitchen, clean the dishes. I would have, if I would have known, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been with her and helped her do the dishes. We would have spent that time together. But because I was so ignorant, I, I, I did so much damage by doing that. I would have helped her with the dishes. And you don't know how much of a sacrifice that would have been for me to do that. Because <laughs> I, since I was eight years old, I've hated doing dishes. In fact, when we got married, I. I thought, I'll never wash another dish again. Thank you, Jesus. I have somebody to wash my dishes for me. But I hated doing the dishes. When I was eight years old, and when it was my turn to do dishes, oh, man, I'd rather have been horse whipped than do dishes. I would sit in front of the sink, and I'd look at this pile of dirty dishes and pots and pans, and, and to me it was just painful to do that. And sometimes it took me two hours to do dishes because it was <laughs> such a drudge. I mean, two hours. I mean, there was times that I got tired of standing there because I just hated to put my hands in that, that dirty water. So I got, I, used to get, I got me a stool, and I put a stool there, and I'd sit, and I'd, <laughs> I'd lean over the sink like this, <laughs> and I'd do these dishes. Well, I did it so slowly, and... and 
because yeah, I, had, I had a reason behind this. I thought if I took long <laughs> enough, my mother would come down like 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night and see me still at the sink, sleeping. <laughs> and she would say, I'll go to bed, I'll do the dishes. Sweet! <laughs> I'd go to bed, and I knew she would do it. But there were some times she would forget to do it. She'd forget to come and look for me. <laughs> And here, I'd still be sitting there, 11 o'clock at night. And my dad would come down, and he'd see me there. And he says, you know what? I don't care. You have to stay here all night. You're going to finish those dishes before you go to bed. So this is what I inherited. <laughs> so one night, I got the idea. I had like two dishes left, but I was so sick of doing it. It was late. And I looked at my, there's a kitchen window right in front of me. I had a little latch on it. I opened the latch, I pushed the window open, I took the two dishes I had left that were dirty and I dropped them out the window and let them fall to the ground. <laughs> there was a big bush right in front of the window. I was throwing the dishes out the window. Well, I did that more than a few times, unfortunately, because it became easier and easier for me to dump the, the dishes out the window. <laughs> Until one day my mother complains, says, where's all my dishes? I can't find dishes anywhere. <laughs> so I had to quit doing that, okay? So I finally was able to finish the doing the dishes. But it was funny, because a few years later, that big bush that was right in front of the window died. And my father said, you know, I'm gonna replace that bush out there. So he's out <laughs> there digging. And I, and I hear him say, what the heck? is this. <laughs> and he yell, Wayne, get over here. <laughs> so I come in, what is this? Here is a whole pile of these dishes that I dropped over the period of time. Some of them broken, some not. He says, go get your mother. <laughs> so I call, Mom, Dad, want you out here. What, what's the problem? She says, here, look, we found your dishes, dear. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> I dumped them all out the window. So it was, it would have been a sacrifice, like I tell you. I still don't like doing dishes, but, I, but we do it, don't we? We do it every we night do it together. together. Yeah. You know, if I would have known that agape love was a sacrificial thing, I would have helped her with the kids before Sabbath. I would have helped them to get dressed. I never did. <laughs> That's a woman's job. I'd get myself dressed, I'd go sit out and tell her to hurry up. Hurry up, we're going to be late for church. He has his suit on, his attache case yeah. already, and I'm running around trying and to she's get... she's trying to get the kids dressed. Three kids dressed. I was the husband that you see occasionally walk into church where he's three feet in front of his wife carrying his attache case while she's walking behind, dragging the kids and all the books and all the blankets. <laughs> And I thought, when the other men see me, they're going to say, yeah, he's got it together. <laughs> he's got it together. He's got his wife under control. He's my role model. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a shame. Terrible. Terrible. I wish I had that to do over again. I'd certainly do it differently. You know, and I would have helped her with the household chores, chores too, if I would have known about sacrificial love. I would have. I did the odd time run the vacuum cleaner, and my wife says, you know, you, 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 you're the sexiest when you're vacuuming. <laughs> <laughs> I never understood that, but I thought, well, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what it is about a wife. She loves to see her husband do some, do some work. <laughs> so anyway, let's, let's understand that what the foundation is. What is the foundation of every marriage? The bedrock is the husbands have to love their wife, sacrifice their life for their wife. Nothing else will work. You can't, set, you can't do any other procedure. It has to be done that way. The man has to love her first, and then she'll respond to that love. That's how God designed it. That's the way it works, and you can't change it. Okay, now there's a second instruction. But before I go to that instruction, I want, you, I want to read something to you. It's 
is in Hebrews 2. I don't make him wash, he dries. Yeah, <laughs> she, she takes pity on me. I do take pity. This is talking about Christ. Hebrews 2, verse 14. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. I know that's kind of the... It's my novel. It's her novel, but so. it's, we're not proving doctrine here. We're just going to read something. It was actually pretty clear, but it's easier to understand in the New Living Version. It says, Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood... Jesus also became flesh and blood by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We all know that Jesus came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for Jesus to be in every respect like us, his high brothers and sisters, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. He then could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself had gone through suffering and temptation, he is able to help us when we are being tempted. So what we're seeing here is Christ, even Christ, he had to come and live and experience what his bride was experiencing on this earth so that he could relate to her so that he knew the pain that she had and the sufferings and all the things that she went through even Christ had to come and live here and experience what his bride was experiencing so that he could be the high priest and go before God and say God I know what's going on because I've lived it I felt it so Christ came first and did that for his bride. So now let's go to 1 Peter 3, because this is a more common one, scripture. 1 Peter 3, and in verse 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. It's a husband's responsibility to understand his wife and how she thinks and what she feels. It's his responsibility to pursue the things that are, concern her. She may be weaker than you are in strength, but, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of a new life. If you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. Do you realize, men? That if we are not treating our, li our wives properly with the love and concern that we're supposed to, that our prayers are hindered. Your prayers are bouncing off the ceilings. My prayers bounce off the ceilings when I was mistreating or not caring for my wife. You know, and I've heard men say, even in the church, that, you know, our, my wife and I, we don't get along very well, and, and, you know, our marriage sucks, but, you know, God and I are tight, you know. We, we got a really good relationship, God and I. You know, she's a problem, but, you know, God and I, we're, we're good. No, you're not. No, you're not. God says if you're not caring for the very person that God gave you to cherish and to care for and to love, your prayers are bouncing off the ceilings. It's that important. It's not something that we can just shrug off and say, you know, it's not, not that important. It is important. You've got to care and love for your wife or your prayers are hindered. That's something that you, as men, we need to understand and realize. Now, my wife is going to share some uh, things about well, we're going to get understanding in. women, and so I'm going to let her take care of this. We're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts now. That those scriptures lay the foundation, and they're foundational to every single thing that we will teach over the weeks, over the months, however long this takes. Um, and it's true, Jesus came to be on the other side of what, a, of what his bride sees, to understand what she sees. And I want to say that Wayne and I are, are a partnership, but you and I, all of us together, we're a team. 
And so these principles are not only applicable between Wayne and I, but they're applicable between each of us in this team because it's all about perspectives. Every one of us have, however many there are of us sitting here, we all have perspectives and we have to learn each other's backgrounds and where we're coming from and why we see life the way we see it that way and, and uh, the things, the hurts and the woundings and the things that have been done to us, we drag with us, they cloud our perspective. It's the lens we always look through life at. But there are other things that I, we want to share with you. And um, I want, I asked Cheryl if uh, her and Terry could come up here. I didn't ask Terry, so it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> And I just want to say, if you see Cheryl's bruise on her eye, Terry didn't sock her. <laughs> she got hit by a baseball. <laughs> Cheryl, come and stand on my side. And this is just a little exercise in perspective. And you yeah. stand right there. And we'll get close to each other right, yeah, can they, right here. Can we get them on video here? Good. OK. OK, I want, this is an exercise in perspective. And this is, think about Jesus coming down and being on, trying to get on our side of the dollar bill, you might say. So I want you to ask him about that, if he sees that. So this is like seeing uh, a situation or a problem in a marriage or a, something that Cheryl wants to discuss with Terry. So she's seeing it from her perspective. So Terry. So um, do you see that eagle with the wings and he's sitting on like a flag? No. And then, the, really well. then there's this pyramid. Don't you see it? There's a pyramid right there, and it has this big old eye. At, no Come on, you have to see it. It's right there in front of you. I know what a pyramid looks like. There's no pyramid here. It's right there. It's in plain sight, <laughs> black or green and white. <laughs> and we can agree it's a dollar bill. Yes. So you're both looking at a dollar bill, because it says one over there, right? Yes. It says one over here. It says one. But from Cheryl's perspective, from her side of the dollar bill, she has a, you can both sit down. It has a Thank pyramid. You. Thanks. Did good. <laughs> it has hey, a pyramid right. and an good eagle. And, that, and that's how we come at life. And, that, and that's that scripture when God says that men are to dwell with their wives with understanding. He needs to come, ar he needs to come around to my side so mm. that yeah. he gets to see it from my perspective. Because I'm driven by relationship. And so I'm always wanting to know about him. When I first married him, I wanted to know about him. I wanted to know what made him tick, especially in, in my set of circumstances. I didn't have any siblings, so no brother and no father, so just a household full of women. And so I, I made it my duty, you might say, to find out what he liked to eat. And so I discovered in the course of all these years that meatloaf is his favorite meal, and he has to have it with mustard. So I never set the table without the jar of mustard for him to, to please him. But I'm, I'm not commanded by God to get on his side of the dollar bill. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells me to dwell with him in an understanding way because I was made relationally. And so I'm seeking to understand. That, and that's what we do as women when we come to church. We're inquiring of each other about how you are, how is your health, how's your children, and whatever. And we gather information. We're building our relationships. And so we need to remember that, that he and I are a partnership, but you and I, we're a team. And so we need to not only understand. This is the beginning of the understanding. The understanding spills over onto the congregation so that I'm seeking to understand you in a variety of ways and you to understand me. So the dollar bill is a good exercise to see that we could be looking at the same situation, but I'm seeing it f coming from my temperament, my gifting, uh, my background. Uh, these are all things we'll be talking about over the weeks, but I'm, I'm looking at that situation, this dollar bill, from my unique perspective. And he's the one who's been asked by God to come around and to look at this dollar bill as Christ did, as Christ did um, mm -hmm. when he came to be on this earth so he could understand that human experience. So one of the things we want to talk okay. about to start well, out. I just wanted to, Go ahead. to jump in on that. I wasn't real good at that at the beginning of our marriage because you know why? 
If I didn't see what she was talking about, oh, yeah. it didn't matter. She didn't count anyway. It was only my perspective. It was only that his counted. perspective that and mattered. So when she was trying to point something out and I didn't see it, it, because I'm entitled, because I'm the man, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, if I don't see it, then your perspective doesn't count. Or it was wrong. Or it was wrong. I either didn't have the right perspective or it didn't matter. And so, with that constantly being put at me, no matter how hard I tried, I was the one buying marriage books. I was the one signing up for classes because I felt if I could just know more, then, then I can make this work, I can, I can repair this. But that's not the, it was out of order. I was out of order and it was never gonna work that way. What I have is truckloads of books and <laughs> gallons of information, and, but. Um, and it took a sacrifice on my part, which I didn't want to do. A man does not want to go on the other side of the dollar bill. He just doesn't think it's important enough. Yeah. And so I didn't make the sacrifice to do that. And unfortunately, it caused a lot of damage in our relationship because I never really took the time to see her, her side of the dollar bill. So we're st this is just a little exercise with the dollar bill, but we're going to go on. We don't have that much time left here. So we're going to go on with uh, a couple of other things to help gain understanding and, and perspective, different perspectives and how uh, women look at things and how men look at things so we can have that understanding. This is a circle. I don't know if you can see it well. All women, I, I, okay, I, I won't say all, I, lived within a circle. Most of the women I know live within a circle. And what that means is we're relational and we always include. We want to be included and we include. And it's very, very um, heartrending to us if we get excluded, whether it be in our family. You know, sometimes um, family members, you know, they secretly go around and they're going to have a dinner, but you find out and then you've not been included in that dinner. That's very hurtful to a woman, whereas to Wayne, since he doesn't live in a circle, he didn't find that, it's like, well, so what, they don't like us or they don't want us there, they've got other reasons why we're not supposed to be there, it's okay, just get over it type of a thing. Uh, I don't know if women, if you can relate to this, that I would never want to sit, if we have a choice when we go to a restaurant, I never choose to sit at a bar, I don't like and I, most women that I know don't like sitting alone. Not a drinking bar. Just... You, know, you know, like the bar at a restaurant where you could, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, clarify that. Um, we don't like sitting along side by side with each other. We prefer to look at each other when we're talking. So we prefer to be at a table that's round or at least square or rectangular. But if it's rectangular, uh, we don't like women to be hanging out there, like if it's an uneven number, that we need to be all sitting around it, facing each other, and we're all squished in, squeezed in together. Wayne doesn't see the problem with any of that if there's like this extra person or this <laughs> seat hanging out there. But even my granddaughter, she can't stand it if there's like uh, two and two and a one here and then this one person. She, never, she doesn't ever want to be this one person out here. She wants to be in the middle of the conversation where we're facing each other. So we, we live our life, women, so this is a clue to men, we live our life in a circle. And so when I invite him or ask him if he would like to go to the store with me, it's not because I need help buying the stuff, but I'm including, I'm trying to include him in my day or in if I, circle. in the circle, or if he's outside fixing something and I'll sit there on the step of the garage or whatever and I'll chat, I'm talking away. It's because I want to be included. I want us to be together. I want us to be having conversation. I'm not there because I know what the wrench is or anything about that type of thing or like in, inviting him to do things with me isn't about that I can't do this on my own. I'm including. Including me into the circle. Into the circle. I'm bringing him into the circle. And he always thought, well, what is she doing? Why? I don't want to go shopping. I don't want to do that thing. What is, the, what is she inviting me for? So here's your letter. But I did when I learned that I should sacrifice my life mm -hmm. because she wanted me to be included in her circle of life that I would 
put my flesh to death and say, honey, I'll go shopping with you because I knew it was important to her to feel like I was included into her circle. It's my circle of life, you know, and, that, and my circle of life is my friends, my family, church people. This is a circle of life, my hobbies, the things that I do. This is where I live is in this circle. And so women invite in, we include, and that's what I did with him. Yeah. He didn't understand. And, and uh, now he has the freedom to say, no, I really don't want to do that because I'm comfortable and secure now because he's loved me over the past 20 years like Christ loved the church that I don't feel put off or excluded. I understand that he doesn't yeah. want to go look at shoes with me or whatever, you know. I used to ride motorcycles a lot with those other guys in the oh, church. Yes. And she likes to ride motorcycles. She, yeah, she used to go with me all the time. Well, the guys wanted to make a, take a particular trip and uh, she wanted to go. And mm -hmm. so I asked the guys, you know, hey, do you mind if my wife comes along? Well, I, I got that stink eye look for sure. You know? <laughs> what? We want to go have fun. We don't want women along on our trip. Well, unfortunately, I chose the men over her. And I left her at home. And I know it, it, was, it was hurtful to do that. And it was hurtful to her because she realized that I chose somebody else over her. I felt you know, excluded yeah, from she, it. She felt excluded from the circle. You know, and I could have took her along and the guys would have probably dealt with it and it wouldn't have been an issue, but I caved because of the peer pressure from the other guys. And it wasn't that I wanted to go on every motorcycle trip. or I just wanted to know I was included. I was thought of. And I, I think on the whole, women are taught more about uh, thinking about the other person. I don't know if it's because we are relational oriented or we're just taught by our mothers, you know, give the bigger piece of pie to the guest, give the last cupcake to the guest, uh, that type of thing. But I was excluded a lot and it hurt my feelings. So remember guys, your wife thinks in a circle she, she's either being included or she's being excluded. So be aware of that, that when she offers you to come with her, it's because she wants you to feel included into her circle. Okay, it's important to remember that. Okay, are we ready to go for the guys? Yep. Okay, here's how the guys relate to each other. If you can see this, this is a ladder. Got bottom wrong, next wrong, up. The, this is how we think. We think in ladder form. And uh, what we do is we, uh, when we come into a room with other guys, Right away, we start looking at, is this guy a rung ahead of me or is he a rung under me? And we, when we do that, unconsciously we do that. That's why when we get together as guys, we ask, uh, you know, what do you do for a living? We really don't care what they do for a living. What we're wanting to find out, is this guy above me on the ladder or is he under me on the ladder? <laughs> and that's how we do it. Our whole life, that's just the way we do it. We're, they're, they're either above us on the rung or they're below us on the rung. Now, unfortunately, a lot of us, like myself, my father, the way he raised me, he made me feel like I was always the bottom rung of the ladder. That I didn't deserve to be any higher on the ladder than the bottom rung. In fact, you're barely even on the bottom rung is kind of how he used to make me feel. And so I went through life believing that, that, that I was... I was dumb, I was stupid, I was I'm never going to be a success in life, so therefore I'm at the bottom rung. And that's how I viewed myself until my wife came along. She made me feel like I was at the top of the rung. I was at the very top. Yippee! I'm at the top of the rung. <laughs> until she said anything to me that made, him feel made me feel bad. bad. I was back down to the bottom rung again. Because he hurt his father. And so I wasn't his father. <laughs> we're playing all the time on this rung of the ladder. And it's true, isn't it, guys? We're that way. Unfortunately, even the guy that you think is at the top of the rung, above you, in his mind, he may still be thinking he's at the bottom of the rung because of the way he was taught. And so we got this thing going on all the time in our life. We're, we're working our way up the ladder or we're working our way down the ladder. And unfortunately, 
anything I might have said, he viewed it as I was putting him somewhere on that ladder. I didn't even know there was a ladder. So I, how can I put him on the ladder when I don't even know a ladder exists? And one thing I want to slip in here is we're, men are at the top of the rung in God's eyes. Yeah. And that's it. You're at the top of the rung in God's eyes, always. And the circle, God always includes us women. We're always included in his, in his world, in his life, in his circle. We're, he, he and I and all of us ladies, we're in that circle together. So we never have to feel like we're excluded. He chose me, he put me in that circle, and we're in that circle together. And the ladder rungs, the men are at the top of the rung because that's where God sees you, is at the top of the rung. But we play these, this is life. The circle being excluded, the ladder up and down, it's life. And unless we stop to think about what we're doing and how we're living our life, because it's really all about perspective. Mm -hmm. So we are always affecting each other. Right. And so we need to be careful. We never want to make our wives feel excluded because that's painful to them, it really is. And my wife, she has to be aware that everything she says to me is affecting me on where I fit on the rung of the ladder. And so it's something that, that we just have to understand because our brains, we think differently. The man, versus, the husband versus, uh, versus the wife. So we got, where are we at? We're at 50 minutes and we got 10 minutes here. I, I got one more to show you uh, that I think we, we need need to, to make clear because you, some of you may have uh, heard this or seen this before, but for those of you who have not seen this before, we want to show you how this works, okay? This is uh, the wife's brain. This Here, is I'll my life. This. <laughs> yeah. It's a salad bowl. That's how she thinks. This is how I think. So I come to him and I say, I'm very disturbed. The, the kids are, aren't doing well in school. Uh, Janie's sick. Oh, and the plumbing, it's, the faucet's dripping, and I, I don't know who to call, and I feel overwhelmed. And we're invited out to dinner, and I have to bring something. I don't know what to make, and everybody has a special diet. And, uh, okay. You're busy, and I need somebody to talk to, and I don't know, I just, I feel overwhelmed. And I have PMS. <laughs> and at my age, <laughs> menopause. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. All day long, every day, the salad bowl gets filled. And my life... Let's put it all in there. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> One more, that'll okay. do it. So my, my life, as, well, it, and it's not just my life, women's lives are like this. It's like we don't separate anything. It just gets, it's all there together, and it's all, and it's, and it's I've got these worries. I've got these concerns. I've, and I can go to God, but I'd be there for hours, you know, telling him about all of these different little varieties of things. But... I needed someone to talk to. I needed someone to sort it out for me. And I'm uh, em uh, emotionally driven, and Wayne is logically driven, and, but he didn't want to deal with this pile of stuff. And so he would say to me, I, I would say, I'm overwhelmed. This is the only word I could ever come up with. I'm overwhelmed. I can't sort through this. I didn't know I had a salad bowl back then, but I can't sort through this. And all these things are all there. To me, it felt like it was all happening in one day. And, but he was of no help to me because he felt like it was my problem and I needed to deal with it. And he hated the word overwhelmed. And I can't remember, he used to say I had awfulism. Awfulism, You just yeah. have awfulism. You live your day on a daily basis it, in awfulism. I don't know if there's a real word like that, but it fit. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. So when she used to come to me and, and want to discuss things, I'd say, fine, well, bring it, tell me what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of her just bringing the, 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 the one item out. The one thing. What she wanted was at the bottom of the bowl. And so I so, like, 
scrounging she had, around. She had to go and talk about all of this other stuff before she got to, one, to the things she really wanted to talk about. And you notice that in my bowl, they all touch. Because in my mind, in most women's minds, it's all connected. It's all connected. This is connected to this, and this is connected to that, and if we could just solve, it's like unraveling a sweater. If I pull this string, the, the, the sweater is going to like undo itself. But all these little pieces of Kleenex are all touching, and they're all laying on top of each other because they're all connected in my life and in my mind. So remember, guys, your wife's brain is like a salad bowl with all that stuff all <laughs> touching and mixed up and confused, OK? <laughs> And so, where's the sacrifice that a man has to make when a wife comes to her, him with the salad bowl? He has to be patient, he has to be kind, he has to uh, be long-suffering, and let her sort through it and be able to work her way through the, her salad bowl. Or help me help work me. my way through it. Give me some logic, give me some direction. Because when it gets this, I mean, I can have logic and direction, it's not like I'm illogical, most of the time. Uh, I have logic and direction, but when it all comes down at once, when it's all coming at me from grandchildren to children and this and that and the whatever, and it all ends up in a bowl and they're all touching each other. And I can't, I don't have for some reason the ability to separate them all out. To me, it's like it's all happening in one hour. You know why? Be. <laughs> because they're multitaskers. Right. Women are multitaskers. They can do 16 things at one time. And that's why she has a salad bowl. That would drive a man crazy. We couldn't do that. And so that's why we end up with what we have. Okay, one more here. This is for the guys. Again, some of you may have seen this before, but I want to uh, show those who haven't seen it before. Now, this is a man's brain. This is what his brain looks like. He has all these little cubby holes in here. With everything that's ever happened to him in his life, he's got a little cubby hole with an item in it. Here, would you hold that for me? Woo, woo, woo. Okay. Yeah, so if you ask a guy, well, what happened over here? What happened at work today? He'll go, oh, let's see, work, 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 work. Oh, here's work. Right. He'll pull it out and he'll be able to talk about what happened at work today. And when he's done, he'll put it back in, and he'll slide it back in the little slot there, and he's good to go. That's how it's very simple. And if you ask him, well, uh, uh, you name it, wh whatever happened today in his life, he would look for it in the hole, pull it out, and talk to you. And he'll tell you all about it, and he'll put it all back in. And as you notice, totally different from a woman's brain, the man's brain is all separated. There's nothing touching anything else. <laughs> he has one here for sex. It's all separated. So women think, well, how could you even think of sex after we've had this fight? Well, because it's right here in this little box. <laughs> it's totally separated. It's nothing touching anything there. What's the problem? And but for a woman, it's like, I, well, I, I, can't, I, I can't deal with this. <laughs> Okay, isn't that how it is, <laughs> guys? Right now, and and I also want besides, to besides that, I have to have everything in my salad bowl in order before I can go to this box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Okay, <laughs> now there's another box in here that all men have. It's empty. There's nothing in this box. We have an empty box. There's nothing in here. And we go there a lot as men. <laughs> the empty box. Because my wife would say to me, what are you thinking? And I go, nothing. There's, I got nothing. And she'd say, well, how could you not be thinking about something? Well, because I'm a man. I just, you know, it's just, not, there's nothing there. It's empty. And so when, and remember when, that. There's nothing wrong with your husband if he says he's thinking nothing. It's normal. Don't, get, don't be upset. But don't, when don't. we were dating and he'd be driving and I'd look over there and I'd say, what are you thinking? Oh, oh yeah. And he'd scramble. Yeah, because I was in my nothing <laughs> box. I was just driving. 
he'd scramble to make something up <laughs> so that he would sound interesting and intelligent <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and you loved it because I did. I was in marketing mode and she was in ecstasy mode when we were <laughs> dating each other, you know, so. <laughs> Those are other subjects. <laughs> okay, so that's how a man thinks. And it's important to understand that, ladies, okay? It'll help you to understand your husband a little better. But it takes putting the flesh to death to get on my side of the dollar bill, just like Jesus put his flesh to death. It takes putting his flesh to death to go <laughs> rumble around in my salad bowl. It takes him putting his flesh to death to know that when I'm inviting him into my circle or I'm upset because I got excluded from a circle, to, to listen and to be a part of my, my life. Okay, we're, we're out of time, but I, I wanna wrap up just real quick so you understand what, what we cover here today. Okay, first thing we covered is we needed a strong foundation in a marriage. You have to have the foundation or else the building will not stand. What is the foundation? A man is to love his wife as Christ loved his bride right. and gave himself for her. We, that's important that we understand that. We need to understand the difference between human love and agape love. Because you can't just survive in a marriage with just human love, it's too fickle, and it's too easily for feelings to change. So we have to do agape love, okay? Then, where'd we go from there? Then we learned about Jesus, uh, says Jesus had to come and experience yeah. life and see what his bride, uh, was feeling before he could relate to her. And, and the husbands, in the same way, are to come to her side of the dollar bill and be able to see what she is thinking and, uh, so, and get, uh, so we can understand her. And then we learned about uh, how a woman thinks with a salad bowl and we learned about the man is Compartments. compartmentalized. And ladders and circles. And ladders and circles. Okay, so that's what we covered today. Next time, we're going to get into some other stuff. This is kind of, was kind of the nuts and bolts. Uh, next time we're going to get into... That's finishing up the differences. The differences. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're done.